from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression with me, Jerry Baker, from the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Thanks very much for listening. If you're not already a subscriber, please do sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please leave us a nice warm review. This week, as the war in Ukraine approaches its first anniversary, I'll be taking a closer look at the progress of the conflict, what might happen next, and the wider implications of the war for the US and the world. And how is the Biden administration handling the other great strategic challenges facing the United States in China, the Middle East, and elsewhere? My guest is distinguished scholar, commentator, and analyst on all things geopolitical. He's John Chipman, chief executive of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, a London-based think tank with a truly global reach. Chipman has written widely on global affairs and is an advisor to corporate and other boards on strategic and security issues. He was educated at Harvard, Oxford, and the London School of Economics, and is now in his 30th year at the helm of the institution known as IISS. John Chipman joins me now. John, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Thank you for having me. So we're at Davos, the annual meeting restored this year to its great, to its heights in January. There are many, many topics, obviously, as usual, that are on people's minds. I think probably it's still fair to say uppermost on people's minds, especially on the geopolitical front, is, of course, the war in Ukraine. We're coming up to the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine. I want to get your sense of where we stand. Obviously, in any war, the fortunes of war ebb and flow. But this has been particularly interesting over the last year. When the Russians invaded it's February, I think most people assumed that they would overwhelm Ukrainian defenses pretty quickly and that the war would be over quite quickly in that way. Then it became clear that Ukraine actually was putting up a very stout defense. That went on for a while. It looked like we might be in for a sort of a longer haul. Then, back in the autumn, Ukraine started to make real advances, regaining some territory, regaining some key cities that the Russians had taken. And people started to talk then about we were within sight of an outright Ukrainian victory. Now things seem to maybe have fallen back again into a sort of attrition, sort of almost even a stalemate, I'm reluctant to say stalemate. Give us your sense from your perspective of where you think we are in this conflict. Well, wars do ebb and flow and this one will continue to ebb and flow. I think what would only make a substantial change is if there were to be a material change in the balance of power. What has been interesting over the year is that things that were thought of as impossible to give Ukraine in March or April became routinized by May, June. Things that were off the table in the summer became on the table again in the autumn. Now there is a debate in Germany about supplying Leopard 2 tanks. If that is possible, then Finland will also supply Leopard 2 tanks. So there's been a sort of very determined step-by-step escalation of the quality of military equipment given to Ukraine. And the Ukrainians have surprised everybody, including the American military who had helped train them from 2014 onwards with the speed of their ability to adapt and make interoperable equipment with which they had not been familiar. I think it is now a settled view, at least among strategists, that stalemate cannot be a goal because a stalemate will not lead to a peace negotiation that will be at all sustainable. Ukraine needs to win. There is Zelensky's 10-point peace plan, but the condition precedent for that probably is that that is negotiated with someone other than Vladimir Putin. So I do think that the Ukrainians will continue to fight with a great deal more vigor. There will be a lot of worry about how the extradition of these newly mobilized troops will possibly have Russia recover little bits of territory here and there, but the sense is not just that Ukraine could win, but that it must. What do you make of the very interesting development recently when Russia replaced its general, its theater, the general who was running the Russian offensive, and replaced him actually with the chief of the defense staff, and Gergo Gerasimov? Now, it did seem that that previous commander had finally settled in on this, what we might call a typical Russian plan of like bombarding infrastructure and bombarding civilian capabilities to essentially kind of undermine the will of the population. This is sort of the classic. And they did seem to be at least brutal and gruesome, as you may seem, making some progress there. Does this represent a change of strategy, of tactics? I mean, what, what's, what's your sense of what the Russians are doing right now? 
Well, the first point to make is that it's never a good sign for the coherence of military strategy or for the confidence in one's commanders that every quarter they're changed. Uh, this is uh, about the third or fourth change that we have seen. It's something to put Gerasimov in charge. It's uh, uh, theoretically, from a hierarchical point of view, a slight demotion, but it obviously even more fundamentally puts the reputation of the general staff in play. And there aren't going to be many alternatives to come if Gerasimov doesn't work out. I'm not certainly would change the nature of Russia's tactics, which appear now fairly settled on major attacks on civilian infrastructure and on civilians themselves, because in the recesses of the Russian political mind, there is still some sense that the Ukrainian will might be broken, not just that the West might be divided or that energy supplies will cause us problems over this now retreating winter, but that the Ukrainians might have their will to fight broken. I think that's a bad bet, but it's a bet to which Putin continues to appear to be committed because he doesn't have a better strategy at present. What could produce a breakthrough? And I mean, you, you know, you've studied wars many, many times. And again, we do seem to be settling in for a longer war here. Could it come from enhanced Western support, NATO support for Ukraine, which gives them a particular military edge? Could it be a renewed offensive from Russia? What should we be expecting? Well, by and large, I would say this, that these wars have ebbed and flowed, but basically Russia is losing against the Ukrainian army that has been supported by the West. Clearly, if the level of support were unconditional, Ukraine would win this war. And one of the paradoxes of this war is that while it might be humiliating for Putin to lose the war to Ukraine, it would be explainable, not just by Putin, but by other leaders in the Kremlin ecosystem if Russia lost because it lost against the West. So to borrow a Russian phrase, there's an interest in the West to escalate, not to de-escalate. Mm. Because if we are seen in the West ostentatiously as the co-authors of a Ukrainian victory, in an odd way, that creates the exit ramp for Putin or that it creates the cliff of Putin falls to be replaced by someone else who will say, this is not my fault. Let's see what we can do now, accepting that Ukraine's original borders pre-2014, perhaps at that stage, are the ones that have to be respected. You talked about Ukrainian will and morale. And what about Western European will and morale? There's been doubts about that all along, and there have been questions about how long the Europeans, particularly some of the kind of, I must say, from our accents, we're both British. The British government has been pretty steadfast in its support. But there's been questions about Macron in France has been saying, talking about the need for a settlement. There's always question marks about the Germans. And there has been doubts, obviously, about what the effect of obviously reduced or almost eliminated Russian energy supplies would be during a European winter. As it happens, the European winter so far has been relatively mild. So maybe that's one reason. What's your sense of the kind of European politics here at play? Are they going to remain steadfast, do you think? I think I would make two points. The first, if you think about the four big NATO countries and how they reacted to the war in the first week or so after it broke out on the 24th of February, every single country reacted according to its own particular strategic culture as adjusted by the particular leader they had in office at the time. So the Biden administration, it's all about NATO. We'll make certain that NATO countries are secure and we will provide defensive equipment. The Germans oh my goodness, there's a war in Europe. We hope it's over soon so that we don't have to take too immediate a decision. Though something was announced a few days later with the Zeitenwender to which we might return. France, there's a war in Europe. Paris can play a role for the concert of Europe and to deal with the big powers. The United Kingdom, there's a war in Europe. We know who's right. We know who's wrong. We're sense. going to support the Let's people who are right. Oh my goodness, yeah. uh, where are the Americans? Because yeah. we look over our shoulder in London and say, are the Americans going to be as forward-leaning as we are? And of course, the United Kingdom will be almost exactly as forward-leaning as the Americans are. They won't be too much ahead. Public opinion in Europe is, I think, much more supportive of this war than are some of the elites and some of the political parties. So you have loud voices on the left and on the right who are great skeptics about this in all European countries, as you have in the United States itself, where there are people on the progressive left or people on the uber Republican right who don't think this is a right decision to have taken. But public support for the war remains strong. It's extraordinarily in Germany. It's still 
polling in the mid 70s of support, 72, 74 percent, and even a slight majority on the very left Der Linke party. So I think some politicians have been a bit surprised by the willingness of the public to sacrifice uh, a little bit for the Ukrainian cause. Many people have been moved by the remarks of the NATO Secretary General who said we might be a little bit cold this winter, but Ukrainians will be dying. How does this end is what I'm tempted to say. But obviously, as you said, the Biden administration has been acting through NATO and seeing this as a NATO exercise, obviously been contributing significant amounts of money backed by the US Congress, despite some of the doubts that you've described that some people have. So significant amounts of US support. US is key, clearly, to this. Britain has been significant in support too, but the US far and away the most. There's been some talk in the US about you know, leaning on the on the Ukrainians, maybe to establish some you know, to peace feelers. Maybe there is, you know, there's time to look for some sort of a settlement. But again, the position of the Biden administration is very clear, which is that the Ukrainians who are fighting, it's their war. They've been invaded. They've got to reclaim their territory and we're with them. Is that going to hold? I mean, if this goes on for a considerable period of time, does the U.S. just essentially open its checkbook indefinitely to Ukraine while it continues to fight this war? Or is this at some point, do you think, Biden administration say you know what, you know, maybe you have to sit down with me. Maybe we have to find some way of reaching some sort of a settlement. What's your sense? Well, I just heard Senator Coons in a public event at the World Economic Forum when asked exactly this question. And he's, of course, well known to be very close to the Biden administration and sits in the U.S. Congress and feels the temperature there. His view was that, if, again, there are people on the left and the right of the U.S. A political spectrum who want this war to end uh, faster and with any kind of peace settlement that might be confected, but the broad will to carry on will be there. Whether that can really be described as a blank check, I don't know. As a strategist, I would say the bigger check financially or militarily that is paid now, the more than what would be saved in the future. And perhaps that is a viewpoint that might become the consensus one in Washington. I'm impressed by how much has changed month by month. So I still hold out the prospect that people, even in the most skeptical capitals, will say not all wars end by negotiation, many wars end because one of the parties has won. On the peace plan, I think that's why Zelensky put it out there, because he also heard General Mike Milley extemporize and suggest that there was a need to consider peace. He's heard European politicians hint at that requirement. So it was important for him to get on the front foot, put out a 10-point peace plan, say that he's not against a settlement that restores Ukrainian sovereignty, and that wisely then put the burden of proof on a willingness to negotiate on Mr. Putin. Last point on this issue is that it would actually be quite difficult even for a U.S. president to insist that Zelensky sign something that didn't have the obvious support of the Ukrainian people. He has been a most extraordinary and charismatic president of Ukraine. But this war is being won by the military. And in any war, domestically, power shifts a bit from the civilian leadership to the military leadership. And I'm quite certain that however unlikely it is, if Zelensky were to hint at a compromise that was unacceptable to his military, the military will say, Mr. President, that's not going to work. And I think that should be understood also in Washington, that while President Zelensky is the image of Ukraine, he has to also be alert to his own internal opinion and particularly that of his own military. Final question on Ukraine. When Russia experiences these setbacks, which it has done many, many times, Putin likes to rattle the nuclear saber and talk of escalation. How real is that? Is that simply blackmail, a nuclear blackmail? Is it bluster? Or is it given presumably the impossibility of Putin accepting defeat in Ukraine, because I think we have to see that that is a pretty implausible outcome for him politically, is it conceivable that he would actually make good on his threat? Mr. Putin is hypersensitive to perceived provocation. He is also hyper-responsive to perceived license. And if he sees that there's license to act because there's not going to be a reaction to that act, he will use that implicit or even explicit license. So he rattles the nuclear keychain because he's aware that many people are worried about this turning into World War III or a nuclear winter that is just extraordinary. The problem is that the West has agency in this strategic 
dialogue. We need to put in Putin's minds uh, what the risks are to him of escalation, as opposed to only discuss intramurally in the West what the risk to us might be yeah. of escalation. That is what strategy is all about. And in the military domain, red lines always become fuzzy. In diplomacy, red lines can hold. You can say, in a commercial negotiation, I'm not going to go below this price point. Or in a diplomatic negotiation, I need my border restored. But in a military exchange, red lines are blurred by the enemy or the opposer. And we can deter the use of even one sub-strategic tactical weapon, as has been attempted to do privately by Bill Burns, in the, the US CIA director, and Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, by no doubt saying in private, all bets are off if you use a tactical or sub-strategic nuclear weapon. A final technical point, a strategic nuclear weapon is in its silo. It's got its warhead on it. It's been targeted. Putin, Gerasimov, Shoigu can take a decision, and 12 minutes later, it can be launched. Tactical nuclear weapons. The warhead is in one place. Uh, the missile is in a second place. The, it needs to be assembled in a third. It then needs to be targeted. Hundreds of people are involved. Right. It is actually quite hard to launch a substrategic tactical nuclear weapon. It would be observable by the West, and we could exercise our deterrent uh, capability at that point. So I don't believe it's a material concern. We're going to take a break there, but when we come back, I'll be talking more about the state of geopolitics with John Chipman, and in particular, how the Biden administration is handling major challenges that the U.S. faces all around the globe. Don't go away. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with John Chipman, head of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. We're talking about the state of the world, and particularly about how Joe Biden's administration is handling the big challenges that we face around the world. Let's broaden out the geopolitical conversation, especially some of the things that are being talked about here at Davos. And let's start with Vladimir Putin's friend without limits, as they described it, back in their famous pact back in uh, last February, Xi Jinping of China. Uh, he's obviously had a, a remarkable year domestically, many, many setbacks, the COVID setback, obviously the abandoning of the zero COVID policy did, of course, get, as he was expected, redesignated for a third term as Chinese president. The relationship between the US and China, obviously, we're focused on Russia a lot for obvious reasons at the moment, but that continues to be the larger strategic question facing the world. The Biden administration, I think perhaps this is just a lot of people's surprise, has proved to be, I mean, Trump came in five, six years ago and kind of caused a lot of alarm with a much more robust approach towards China, particularly on economics, than previous administrations have been. The Biden administration, for all of its criticism of the Trump administration, seems to have to some extent continued with that pretty hawkish policy towards China, some of its measures on technology, some of the other things. How do you see that? There are some indications that maybe there's a thawing in the relationship. Maybe the Chinese want a slightly better relationship. Obviously, Biden and Xi met recently at the end of last year. What's your sense now of where that relationship, how much of it is affected by the Russia picture? How much of it is affected, obviously, by the continuing threat to Taiwan? And what's the equilibrium here for that relationship? Well, let me make the bridge here. Of course, there are many in Washington who might argue that Russia is the weather, but China is climate change strategically. But the fact is that the West needs to prevail in its original area of core competence, so to speak, the European security order, if it is to have any credibility in protecting a free and open Indo-Pacific and being true to its alliance partners in the Indo-Pacific. And I think this U.S. administration has now seen that codependent relationship between the European and Indo-Pacific strategic theaters. There is a bipartisan approach generally to the issue of China and the fact that it is a enormous a challenge to U.S. interests and, of course, to U.S. values, and that it has extraordinary capacity behind it, which is less the case also with Russia. You have important voices in the U.S. business community that are saying, beware of complete decoupling, and that is going to have an effect on the way in which a U.S. strategy is implemented. Funnily enough, amongst the climate change professionals, they say the aim should be decoupling, because that 
will be the only way to ensure we don't waste energy importing things stupidly from China instead of producing them locally and then yeah. selling them locally. So I've heard... The rare uh, convergence between the, the domestic nationalists and the climate change. It's quite yeah. an extraordinary yeah. thing, just as it has been in Europe, by the way, for some observers to see that Green Party politicians, like the foreign minister of Finland or the foreign minister of Germany, are amongst the most, in inverted commas, hawkish on the Ukraine crisis. To come back to your original phrasing, the Chinese know that Putin is a failed leader. I know that at the G20 meeting, when that very carefully phrased communique was being framed, the Chinese essentially told Foreign Minister Russia Lavrov, that's it, we're not going to move anymore. And he had to shuffle off and the G20 communique was, as they say in diplomacy, balanced as a consequence. So Xi Jinping is not going to put any major bets on President Putin. And President Putin has an, and his entourage are coming very much to the realization that they are an extremely junior partner to China. Is this a new Cold War between this time with uh, China as the dominant partner on the uh, totalitarian, authoritarian side rather than Russia between the West and the East? There's too many differences between this conflict and the one that we styled the Cold War to use the same terminology. One magnificent difference is that China is super globalized in the international world economy in a way that the Soviet Union absolutely wasn't. So it's one thing to have a military confrontation with a major power. It's another one to have it with the second biggest economy in the world to which so many others, including your principal allies, are so umbilically linked. So I think it would be best to have a a clever analyst come up with a different phrase to define the U.S.-Chinese competition. There is, to change subjects ever so slightly, another potential Cold War slightly on the horizon about which we in the West need to be careful, which is I sometimes worry that too many Western politicians frame things in terms of democracy versus authoritarian states. And sadly, many of our strategic allies are not uh, members of the perfect democratic club. And And India, maybe Turkey, or... And numerous um, countries in the GCC and even a very close friend in ASEAN and elsewhere who have had elements of democracy but still single-party states in office. I would say this. Good governance without democracy is safer strategically than is democracy without good governance. And so the Western stance should simply be to promote good governance because, by the way, an ancillary consequence of good governance might be a democratic path and a democratic end, but not to promote democracy for another important reason, which is that democracy isn't really well exported. The non-tariff barriers to entry to democracy are rather high. Democracy has to be organically grown from within one's own civilization, maybe lightly fertilized from abroad, but not too much uh, affected by external ingredients. So I do worry about that values-based Cold War a little bit. It, as much as I value more importantly about any unfortunate extreme conflict between the United States and China. We talk about some of those allies who are, let's say, inconveniently not particularly democratic. Let's talk about the Middle East, which is obviously where some of those are concentrated. You mentioned the GCC. I want to talk about the U.S., particularly U.S. strategy in the Middle East over the last couple of years. It does seem that Biden's had a pretty hard time in that region. He, first of all, came in, wanted to restore the Iran nuclear agreement, and so far has failed to do that. Doesn't look like that's going anywhere. He came in with this very robust sort of moral foreign policy, critical of Saudi Arabia, of Mohammed bin Salman, in particular the crown prince over the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, took a very hard line on that, and then found himself rather sort of tail between his legs, having to run to Saudi Arabia and ask them to increase oil production, got snubbed there. Afghanistan, obviously not strictly in the Middle East, but some strategists talk about as the greater Middle East, didn't exactly end well for the United States there. Is the experience of the last two years suggesting to you that U.S., you know, this has been such a strategically important reason, but are we seeing U.S. influence there wane and diminish? And if so, what does that mean for what happens there and for the security of U.S. interests? U.S. influence for the moment is slightly waning, but rather like in war, diplomacy outcomes can ebb and flow as well. A few years ago, the Middle East was the number one strategic theater in the world for the United States, Asia number two, Europe number three. Now it's switched around. It's Europe number one, Asia number two, Middle East number three. These three geostrategic regions alternate for their number one position in the American strategic calculation. And the other two regions always complain and worry about 
about the lack of attention paid to them. So this is just the unfortunate element of being a superpower. There has been a bit of a problem in the Middle East in that the engagements in the Middle East are framed in the domestic public debate in the United States as transactional. And therefore, if a transaction fails, it appears that the whole relationship has fallen apart. And that happened in the instant case with President Biden's uh, visit to Mohammed bin Salman, when the presumption was that that was a transactional uh, visit to assure that OPEC-3 would take the view that the American administration wanted. And then there was shock horror when OPEC-3 acted in a way that actually most experts expected them to act and not just on demand for a U.S. signal when the relations beforehand hadn't cultivated a bilateral relationship that would allow for a bit of a change of policy at that point. So I think for the United States to recover a little bit more of its influence in the Middle East, it just needs to be a little bit more regularly present, of course. And I fully appreciate all of the priorities that are placed on U.S. government leaders. But diplomacy is a contact sport. And in the Gulf, uh, like in many other parts of the world, you have to be seen to be present in a persistent way. Final question, John, and forgive me, it's a slightly parochial one from the U.S. perspective, but um, that's just where we are. How do you rate the last couple of years in terms of the way the Biden administration has handled these big strategic issues? Obviously, we've seen that the disastrous exit from Afghanistan, which was a considerable black mark, and not just in its own terms, but I think in terms of the way people saw the United States. I think people probably perhaps generally give the United States slightly higher marks of its handling of Ukraine, the support for Ukraine, although there are some question marks about whether or not perhaps more could have been done to deter Russia from invading Ukraine. And maybe it was the what happened in Afghanistan that one of the factors that persuaded Vladimir Putin to go ahead and invade Ukraine. We've talked about the Middle East. We've talked about China. Give us a sense of, first of all, what you think the Biden administration is trying to achieve in this strategically complex world. And secondly, your estimation of how well it's going about achieving it. Well, I would say two things. First, The way in which the Afghanistan withdrawal happened and the immediate consequences were quite a shock to the U.S. NATO allies, some of whom spoke quite openly at the time about it, including the U.K. Secretary of Defense. But the need then to respond with vigor on Ukraine recovered a lot of the United States strategic capital in Europe. It also reminded people like President Macron of France that European strategic autonomy is a phrase without an immediate prospect. Without the United States, Russia could well have had a victory in Ukraine. So the European security order still depends on the United States and European allies see that. I think what has been at the core of the Biden administration's approach is to support a multilateral order as much as is reasonably possible, with the United States still having preeminent influence in that multilateral order. And I think what is interesting the United States has done, and it actually happened a bit at the beginning of the Trump administration, is not rely just on major alliance systems, but encourage minilateral arrangements. So the Quad in the Indo-Pacific, for example, with Japan, Australia, India, and the United States, the AUKUS agreement with the United Kingdom, the United States, and Australia, the Abraham Accords that were, of course, infected by President Trump, with brought two Gulf countries into formal diplomatic relations uh, with Israel. And we see other minilateral arrangements taking place. And when big alliance systems struggle, the United States animating some of these minilateral arrangements can give a measure of stability to the variety of regions in which they're working. So I think that's been an interesting innovation of American foreign policy, to which many others have now subscribed. John Chipman, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Thank you very much. Well, that's it for this episode of Free Expression. Thanks very much for joining us. I'll be back next week with another exploration of one of the pressing topics facing the world. In the meantime, have a great week and goodbye.